Welcome back to the Balancing Act podcast. I'm Andy Tempty. On the Balancing Act, we talk to business leaders and industry experts to explore the balancing acts we play in our professional lives and learn about the events that put rocket boosters behind their career success. Today, we have Dave Rogers joining us. Dave is a fellow musician and is the chief executive of the literally world famous Dave's Guitar Shop right here in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I have my little prop here as a sticker from Dave's Guitar Shop. That it, that logo there is world famous. We'll be focusing on entrepreneurship today and Dave's entrepreneur, entrepreneurship journey. Welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you. Honored to be here. Yeah. We're, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Uh, so I'm a rock and roller. You're primarily blues, right? Blues and, and yeah, maybe more 60s, 70s rock, I guess, yeah. Yeah. What got you to blues? Where, where was that connection? <clears throat> well, uh, when I was a, a younger man, you know, in the late 60s, uh, my brother was a guitar player, my older brother, and he had all the, all the great albums for that period, Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, you know, Cream, Almond Brothers, and all of that was blues based, really, you know, so that was like next generation blues. So that takes you back. Yeah. You know, and then you just investigate where that all came from. Yeah. So. Yeah. What, what, a, what a great guitar player. Uh, Dave, I ask all my guests this question. Uh, give us a little bit more of your story. Well, uh, I was born and raised in Marshfield, Wisconsin, moved to La Crosse when I was 21, um, worked various jobs. Um, when I first came to town here, I, I worked for a carpet cleaning place and uh, uh, bartended a little bit. Um, got a job at Dahlberg's Music, if you remember Dahlberg's. I do remember okay, Dahlberg's, sure. yeah. And, um, and uh, when they were going out of business, retired... Um, I applied at all the other music stores in town. And the only thing I knew about was guitars and nobody would hire me because they wanted somebody who could do the band instrument, pianos, sure. all of that stuff. So, so I had no choice, but to kind of do my own thing then. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I'm family friends with the light holds. Uh, oh, we, of course, we went yeah. to, we yeah. went to church together at first Presbyterian. Sure. So Dahlberg's was the mortal enemies uh, down, <laughs> down, 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 <laughs> down, sure, the down the street. Yep. Yep. Sure. <laughs> I think that's where, uh, uh, that's on the block where uh, Lindy's is, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, listeners. We're we're gonna geek out <laughs> a little bit here on our on our uh, local lacrosse history. We'll try to minimize that. Uh, Dave, uh, one event in your life that just put rocket boosters behind your career. Well, there was one time where I was at um, a music store in in Minneapolis, a store called Newt Cape. And uh, <clears throat> the owner, one of the owners of the store was Jeff Hill. And uh, I was trying to make a living playing guitar at that time and struggling, of course, of course, as most musicians will. And, uh, you know, he was dealing with me and I was buying some guitars from him or whatever. And he just seemed so happy to be there, so thrilled. And a, a light bulb went off over my head. I was like going hey, if I couldn't make it playing guitar, maybe, you know, buying and selling, having a little business. And I mean, he inspired me to start a, start a shop up. So. Yeah. It, it, I, I love asking that question because it's uh, the answers are usually there's some mentor that, sure. uh, that, that gave me my start, saw something in me that I couldn't, or that light bulb moment of, oh, I want to be like that person. And, or some massive failure that <laughs> sure, sure. like woke them up and like okay, there's got to be uh, there's got to be a better way. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, let's go back to the beginning and do a deep dive. How did you get your start uh, selling selling guitars? You had that light bulb moment, but what were the early <clears throat> years of leading the shop like? Well. Even before I ever had the shop, I mean, as a young man, I scoured the newspaper ads, pawn shops, anything. And if I could find a, what I thought was a good deal on a guitar, even if it was something I didn't care about or didn't want, I bought it and made some money on it, trading it for something I did want. So, I mean, even as, you know, in my early teens, I was doing that, oh. not for a living, but just because I couldn't afford the guitars I wanted. So I'd scrounge around, find some bargains and trade them in for something I would like. Um, 
so, I mean, that, it was always in my mind that way. But, um, you know, after Dahlberg's went out of business and I couldn't get a job elsewhere, I lived in a, a trailer home, a, a mobile home, and it was a two-bedroom mobile home. And in one bedroom, I had like a, a little guitar shop. Nice. And uh, it, then lived there and uh, did my business out of there. And uh, out in the, there's a shed out there, uh, like a little uh, lawn care shed. And I had a spray booth set up out there and I'd refinish guitars out there and then hang them up in my kitchen to cure. Smelled pretty good in there. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, one of the guys I played in the band with said, you're doing enough business. You, you should rent a place and actually start your own business. And I rented a place on uh, Ward Avenue, a little 20 by 20 space and, um, in 1982. And, and you know, when I first started, I was like going, well, if I can make my trailer payment and put some food on the table, I'm good, you know? Yeah. And and it just kind of blossomed from there. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, what date are you counting the start from then? Because you're, you're past 40 years. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're, we'll be 42 this year. So 1982, July 1st, 1982, I opened up. When, when you opened the doors. Yep. Officially. So you're not counting the, in the. No, not the trailer part. Not the, not the (laughs) trailer, not the trailer room. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Well, I'm, you know, I've already asked the accelerant uh, question, but I'm curious if there was a moment that you can pinpoint for our listeners when when the shop really took off. Uh, this is that moment that entrepreneurs want to know about. Sure. So can you share that with us? Well, there's almost two. I mean, I started doing um, international guitar shows in Dallas, um, Chicago, Philadelphia, <clears throat> and I'd go down there with a... Um, with basically everything I had and uh, put them out for sale. And there's a lot of international buyers there. And I had a little um, sign up sheet where they could sign up for my monthly mailer. And, um, and so it really turned the business more international at that point. And that would have been probably late eighties. And um, so that really exploded the business quite a bit. And uh, you know, every month when we sent out that flyer we would be busy for about two weeks and then would be quiet for two weeks And uh, in the late 90s, a a friend of mine came up to me and said, what if I set up something for you that you get a guitar in and five minutes later, a customer in Japan can see it with photos? Because before that, we're we're taking Polaroid photos of these guitars, mailing them to the customers. Right, right. And I'm like going, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And he says, he says, I can set that up for you. I don't want any money up front. All I want is 5% of anything you sell off of that. And I, I was... I've always been a little bit dim, but I was smart enough to go like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, let's work out a fee initially. And, and, uh, and he put my first website up in the late nineties and, and that, that made everything just crazy. Yeah. We, we both uh, grew up in the era where the physical flyer was, yep. uh, was a thing uh, in, in my business in education. Uh, we had a very similar uh, s- story where there was a mailing list that we could buy for people that were taking the exams that we were studying for. And when we sent that physical flyer out, then Oh my goodness! The phones are just going bananas. The fax machine is oh yeah, fax machine. Yeah, we're rolling. getting orders through fax machines with credit cards written on them and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> the, the old days. Yep. Yeah, and then the the credit card the the fax paper would be in a, a desk drawer somewhere, and everybody's credit cards are just yep. it's, it's, from a today perspective is just hor- horrific. Yeah. Uh, different times. It was horrific governance, but yeah, <laughs> wow. Um, I I, I want to ask a, a little bit more later about some of the musicians that you've uh, that you've met, but let, let's uh, let's dive into the kind of guitar acquisition uh, process just a little bit more. Uh, how today? How do you identify where to? go and search for those rare finds is I got to imagine it's a lot harder today than it it was, you know, back in the day, you know, people would come with guitars, have no idea what they're worth or whatever. And I always tried to be real, real fair with them and and all that kind of educate them. Um, And now it almost seems like the opposite is true. They have, they, they have unrealistic expectations of what they have. And, and I quit doing the guitar shows 10, 15 years ago, because it got to a point where 
back in the day when we do the Dallas show, we'd do as much business there in a weekend that I'd do in a month at the shop. Right. Now it's to a point where we do as much business in a weekend that we've, that we do at 10 shows. You know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. just like, there's no need for it anymore, but you would find some guitars there, but you're competing against every other dealer that's there. Yeah. Um, so finding, you know, finding rarities, I don't take a whole lot of time for that anymore. We have a lot of people reaching out to us, but I mean, to actually go around and try to dig these things out of the woodwork is so time consuming mm. and so uh, not rewarding. Um, it, it's just about finding a needle in a haystack anymore. Yeah. So that was, that was a real critical part of your flywheel when you got started, when we got started but yeah. it's not, uh, well, and not when anymore. we first started, we just dealt and used in vintage as, as time went on, um, different companies reached out to us, you know, Fender, Gibson, Paul Reed Smith. And so now we do so much business with those guys, designing our own guitars, picking out the woods and everything like that. Our business has really gravitated towards that. We still do the the vintage and the rare guitars and I still collect vastly so, but um, the majority of our business is more like what we've designed or built and yeah. sell through the shop now. So yeah, yeah. For our listeners, you should see uh, the, the this guy's uh, co- collection uh, right right outside his office. It's incredible. Uh, Dave, it wouldn't be the Balancing Act podcast if I didn't discuss a balancing act. What's the primary balancing act that you've had to play throughout your career, and what if anything have you had to sacrifice to become the Dave Rogers that we see today? Well. It's funny because I'm I'm almost not a human anymore. I mean, I, you know, like people ask me how your day was, and I say, "Oh, business was really good." No, they said, "Dave, how was your day?" And I was like, "I am the business." I mean, I've sacrificed it, it all, but I mean, I've loved every minute of it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, do I have much of a life besides the guitar shop? Uh, it, it, what I have is is great, and I'm enjoying the heck out of it. But I mean. I, I kind of live and breathe guitars, you know. You get you get your dog wandering around the shop. Oh right? yeah, yeah. My 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 dogs they're all with me twenty four seven. Yep. So yep. it's it's really cool. You you go into the shop and uh, and and Dave's. I've only seen the one. You have, oh, you have I, there's two? a couple of there's them there. There's a cu- yeah, yeah. couple of you. dogs wandering yeah. around. Folks, uh, folks, uh, you know, riffing and yep. jamming on on guitars, just sitting around is such such a cool place. It's a casual environment for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to take a really short commercial break, and we'll be right back with Dave Rogers. Has trust broken down in your organization? Learn how smooth workflows enable accountability and unlock trust to create long-term business success. Learn more in my new book, The Balanced Business, available today at Amazon.com and wherever books are sold. And we're back with Dave Rogers talking about the world of entrepreneurship, blues, rock and roll, and guitars. Uh, Dave, I like to run thought experiments. Uh, Let's run one here. Suppose that you have a budding entrepreneur sitting right in front of you right now in that camera. What advice do you have for them before they dive in? And what's the most important mistake that you're going to help them avoid? Well... I've never been the world's best business guy. I'm not business educated at all. Um, the only advice I'd give is find your passion and, and, and chase it because it, I, I did that and I didn't know I could make a living with that, but it turned out pretty well for me, but I've never felt like I've ever gone to work a day in my life. <sighs> you know, I mean, it's just finding what I loved and, and doing it. And it, it turned out to be rewarding financially but I didn't do it because of that. Right, right. So I don't know if that's good advice or bad advice, you know? Well, I think it's great advice because uh, the way that I translate that is that you've connected, you found your personal purpose. Yeah. You found your, why am I here? Right? Sure. And you've been able to tie that, why am I here, into a, into a business venture. So I can completely connect with what, with what you were saying, because the same thing happened to me. I'm an educator. My purpose is to teach, coach, mentor, and hopefully inspire others. So I was able to run an education business 
and yeah, there were certainly days when I woke up and I felt like it was work and it was a grind <laughs> and you know, that, that happens to the best of us. Sure. But, uh, most days I'd, no matter how much of a bummer things were, I got to drive into the office knowing that today we're going to create a Yahoo moment for somebody and their, and their families. And, you know, you create joy. Yeah. We sell happiness for sure at the business yeah. at the shop. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Abs- absolutely. Uh, you know, if we wandered around my house here, uh, there's, there's one Dave's guitar. Yeah. We'll uh, see some guitar. choice locations around here too. Yeah. Uh, t- Taylor's uh, are my acoustic choice and Paul PRS. Reed Smith. Yep. And you really helped me out. I have a prize possession on the wall over there, which is the back plate signed by Paul Reed oh, Smith. Sure. So I will I carry that with great pride and I only have that because you chased your passion. So thank you so much for that. Um, This is going to be so so much fun. Uh, You, you lead a world famous operation in a small town. You've met lots of famous musicians, multi-part question. If you had to pick one encounter that stands out for you most of those famous encounters, who would that be? And, you know, musicians get stereotyped with big egos. Uh, who's the kindest, coolest, most down to earth uh, you've ever met? So, so first is what's the, you know, what's the biggest? Sure. And then who's, who's really the kindest, coolest, yeah. most genuine? Well, I would say, um, the biggest moment for me ever, because he's my favorite guitar player and my hero since the '60s, uh, was meeting Eric Clapton and being able to sell him some oh, guitars. Oh wow! So that that was that was numero uno for me. But I mean, uh, you know, we've sold things to Bob Dylan, uh, Rolling Stones, um, but the most humble and, and most of these guys are, are pretty normal guys. I mean, they, they're like me talking to me and you. We're, t- we're talking guitars. They, they're passionate about it. Yeah. Um, there's been some egos, but I mean, in general, it's been pretty, pretty cool. But uh, like Vin Skill was probably the nicest, most down to earth guy. There was one time he was playing in lacrosse on Sunday and he was playing in Madison on Friday. And he called me up on, um, he called me up Saturday morning and, and said, um, Hey Dave, I want to come up, you know, visit the shop and everything like that. Um, is that going to be good? And I said, well, you're playing here on Sunday. I'll just open up the shop for you and you can come hang out. Nobody will bother you or anything like that. And uh, he's like going, my God, Dave, I'd never ask you to come in on your day off. He <laughs> he took him and his tour bus driver came up from Madison on Saturday just to hang out at the shop. And I was like going, hey, you want me to rope off the upstairs so you can just hang up there and, and do your thing? He says, oh, no, no. And the store was jam-packed with people. Everybody knew him. Sure. And he was just like the most kind, generous guy signing autographs for anybody, talking with everybody. And he would, he would, he insisted on making a run on Saturday where he could have, he would have been in town on Sunday anyway. And and uh, given what you've told me about how your connection with your work, you you probably would have been in the office exactly. on Sunday I'm there on Sundays anyway. anyway, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and another one was um, yeah. that was fun was um, old Brad Paisley. He flew in early when he was playing here one time. He flew in early because he wanted to see the shop, and yeah. he spent a, a lot of time there. And and he, he's like going, um, he was looking at the collection room, and he's like going, Dave. You have the perfect life. He says, I, I envy you. And I said, here's a guy who's married to a movie star, as I remember it, flying in on his own private jet, playing show, sold out stadiums nightly. And he's like saying, Dave, you have the life. I'm right. like, going, you know, that, that he was another great guy. Yeah. yeah. So for our listeners, that is a lesson in perspective. When you're looking at somebody else and saying, oh my gosh, I really love the life that they have. They're probably looking at you going, oh, I really, really envy the life that you have. So, uh, you know, Pick. Grass is greener on the other side always, I yeah. guess, yeah. The, the gr- and it's uh, that's actually a quote in my first book. The grass is not always greener on the other side. It's just different grass. There you go. There you go. <laughs> 
Well, Dave, uh, as we run to the close of the show, uh, I've got a couple of lightning round questions for you, a little bit of fun. I give you access to a time machine and you only have like 280 characters to send to a previous version of yourself. What's the message and what previous version of yourself do you send it to? Well, when I first got out of high school, I I so wish I would have taken life a little more serious. I mean, there was, there was years of, um, playing in bands, having fun, partying, maybe a little bit too much and, uh, too much. Yeah. And, and (laughs) at 25, I started taking life seriously saying, Oh, what am I going to do for a living? All of this wasted seven, eight years that way. I mean, I, I wish I could go to my senior high graduation and said, Dave, you know, get off your butt, you know, take life seriously here. So. Yeah. But even that's a balancing act, right? Yep. When, when, cause our frontal lobes aren't formed until we're as males until sure. 45 anyway. Okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing, but it's, it's early twenties sure. uh, for sure. And sometimes mid late twenties. So yeah, we Mine gotta, are still forming. I think, I don't know. Yeah. That's why I said mid forties, yeah. because that's when I think, <laughs> that's when I think it all came together sure. for me. <laughs> um, we're all works in progress. Uh, what are you working on today to help uh, Dave Rogers grow and flourish? You know, I feel so good about where everything is at right now. We've got four stores now. Um, business is, is going great. Um, all the companies that we deal with are back up and running, you know, after the pandemic. Um, I, I, I literally don't know what the next move is going to be or, or, or what we're going to do. Um, I don't plan on ever retiring. I just love what I'm doing. I mean, if I have to take a day off from the shop, I, I suffer. I mean, I, I really do. I, I just love it that much. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And if opportunities arise, I'm going to jump on them, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, this is literally world famous Dave Rogers <laughs> sitting right here talking to you right now. And as an entrepreneur, Take some lessons uh, from what Dave had to say. Uh, Dave, final question: What what is uh, where, where can folks where can folks find you? Uh, uh, well, my uh, email address is dave at davesguitar.com. Website is uh, www.davesguitar.com, and uh, we're right on twelve twenty seven Third Street, Lacrosse. It's the old Happy Joe's building. It is. It, it is. Yeah. See, I remember when I bought that building, I was like going, I'll never, ever outgrow this place. This is huge. And uh, I mean, we're probably 10 times the size of that now, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very cool. Dave, it was such a pleasure talking to you today. today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm honored to be here. All right. My name is Andy Tempty. This is the Balancing Act Pod- Pod- Podcast. You can find us on all the major streaming services. Please like, subscribe, rate, and most importantly, share this public good with your friends and your colleagues. The show is produced by Nicholas Tempty. We'll see you next time. <laughs>